My name is Debbie Whaley, and I'm the pastor here at Mount Washington Presbyterian Church. We just have one announcement for you this morning about some exciting news about a staff change that's happening. Our delightful youth director, Ashley Ross, is going to be promoted to being the director of family ministries. Now, don't worry, she's still going to be the primary youth director here. But given her leadership during this COVID season, we have seen Ashley shine in her ability to lead and vision for our overall ministries to family, including children, as well as youth. Now, Ashley's not going to be responsible for the front line uh, work with children. We're still going to hire a Sunday school coordinator or, uh, or what we might call a, a Sunday school superintendent who will be able to work for a few hours. But Ashley's responsibilities are now to, going to expand so that we can develop a comprehensive approach to educating our children so that they may come to know the love and justice of Jesus Christ. So whether from birth through high school and even into college. Ashley's gonna oversee that program, but her primary responsibilities and where her heart remains is with youth. Kathy Siebert, who is the administrative assistant in this department, is also stepped up in many, many amazing ways over this, these last few uh, months, and she will continue to help and partner with Ashley and the whole children, youth, and family department of our session. So I hope you'll join me in congratulating Ashley on this new promotion. I hope you will pray for our ministry so that our continued love for children and family in the Mount Washington and Anderson uh, Township can really become more effective, more vibrant, and bring more people to Christ. So now let's prepare our hearts as we begin our time of worship together. Welcome to worship at Mount Washington Presbyterian Church. Take a moment, prepare your hearts, and enter into this moment of contemplative music to prepare your souls for worship. And yet, even though enormous and gigantic and powerful God is, God cares about you. So let us, with praise and gratitude, worship God together. Thank you. 
join me in the prayer of confession. God of grace, we are grateful to you for knowing our needs and cares before we even put them in words, whether in prayer or to others. Before we even clear our throats to speak, you know what is in our hearts. And yet we don't always turn to you when we're troubled and we don't always trust you to help us navigate obstacles and come out on the other side. We don't always recognize the new opportunities you provide for us through the challenges we face. Forgive us, Lord, for we are truly sorry for not thinking to turn to you first and not trusting you to show us the way. Make us more faithful, prayerful people closer to the children that you created us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Friends, our sins may be big, but our Savior is bigger. Know that in God's abundant grace, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And welcome to the loveliness and peace of this beautiful green pasture. This morning, we're going to be looking at the 23rd Psalm. In fact, all of September, we're looking at the 23rd Psalm. And the 23rd Psalm was written by that little shepherd boy who took out the tall, great, giant Goliath, David. In fact, we'll be following David also for the whole month of September. The 23rd Psalm, I bet many of you know this Psalm. In fact, I bet it's close to your heart. In fact, I bet it's almost memorized. What if I said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I bet in your mind you can already think of the next line. Well, here's your challenge, kids of all ages at Mount Washington, here's your challenge. I want to challenge you for the month of September to memorize the 23rd Psalm. Memorizing scripture is really amazing because you can take it with you wherever you go. You don't have to be at church. You don't have to be near a phone. You can take the Word of God wherever you are in your heart, and it's helpful for those little gray cells in your brain. So, if you would like to journey with us throughout the month of September and challenge yourself to memorizing the 23rd Psalm, send me a video and we'll see how our progress goes. Let's say it all together before we leave.
The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He restores my soul. He leads me in the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. There's your challenge. I look forward to seeing how you challenge yourself and memorize the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. He lets me rest in fields of green grass and leads me to quiet pools of fresh water. He gives me new strengths. He guides me in right paths as he has promised. Even if I go through the deepest darkness, I will not be afraid. Lord, for you are with me. Your shepherd's rod and staff protect me. You will prepare a banquet for me where all my enemies can see me and you will welcome me as an honored guest. I know that your goodness and love will be with me all my life, and your house will be my home as long as I live. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This morning, our second reading comes from the first book of Samuel, chapter 17, verses 20 through 37. David rose early in the morning, left someone in charge of the sheep, took the provisions, and went as Jesse had commanded him. He came to the encampment as the army was going forth to the battle line, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. David fled the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage, ran to the rakes, and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before, and David heard him. All the Israelites, when they saw the man, fled from him and were very much afraid. The Israelites said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. The king will greatly enrich the man who kills him, and he will give him his daughter and make his family free in Israel. David said to the men who stood by him, 
What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that should defy the armies of the living God? The people answered him in the same way. So shall it be done for the man who kills him. His eldest brother Eliab heard him talking to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. He said, Why have you come down? With whom have you left few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart. You will have come down just to see the battle. David said, What have I done now? It is only a question. He turned away from him towards another and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again as before. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. David said to Saul, let no one's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are just a boy, and he has been a warrior from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down, rescuing the lamb from its mouth, and if it turned against me, I would catch it by the jaw, strike it down, and kill it. Your servant has killed both lions and bears, and his uncircumcised Philistine shall be like this one of them. Since it has defined the armies of the living God, David said, The Lord, who saved me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, will save me from the hands of the Philistine. So Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Today we begin a new sermon series called Faith That Perseveres. I don't know about you, but in these ongoing COVID times and our time of political unrest and issues around social justice, not to mention the challenges in the world like locusts devastating crops or hurricanes and fires, we need to know that there is a faith that enables us to persevere in the face of all these challenges. And so during the month of September, we're gonna be looking at a really favorite biblical character, the character of King David. And in fact, today we're gonna spend a little bit of time looking at the beginning of the story, that great Bible story that we all remember from Sunday school of the story of David and Goliath. We're gonna explore it both this week and next week, and then explore some of the rest of David's life as he models for us a faith that perseveres. Well, when we begin the story this week, we're in the middle of a story that is just beginning to unfold. We're being introduced to David, who is a brand new character in the story of 1 Samuel. As you may recall, the people in the book of Judges have started to complain and just lift up their voices and cries to God, demanding that they have a king, a, a king just like the other peoples around them. And so God sends the prophet Samuel to anoint a new king for Israel. And that first king of Israel is a man named Saul. Now, in the beginning, Saul serves God with a sense of optimism, a sense of faithfulness, but when, by the time we get into the middle chapters of 1 Samuel, we begin to see that Saul has lost sort of his ability to trust God fully. We see the beginning of what we imagine to be a mental illness, and he begins to fall apart at the seams. And while God sort of loses faith in Saul, so to speak, and his ability to lead the people of God, as does Samuel, in chapter 16 of 1 Samuel, of 1 Samuel, God sends Samuel and anoints David, this young shepherd boy from the town of Bethlehem, and says that this will be the second king of Israel. Now, when this happens, it's a big surprise because there's nothing about David that would suggest he's been, quote, battle-tested or that he's even mature enough to take on this mantle. And for us, that might be a little bit confusing. But in the ancient time, oftentimes, spiritually, someone is given an identity and a role, and it may take years or even decades for them to grow into that role. In other words, the identity of David as a king of Israel is set, the, the pathway is set, the course is readied. But before David can fully live into that call that, or that mark that God has put on David's life, 
There will be experiences that he needs to go through, tests that he will need to pass in order for him to fully live in to the coronation or the crowning or the fulfillment of that call to be Israel's second king. And so when we begin uh, in chapter 17, we see that there's a crisis going on in the state of Israel. Their longtime enemies, the sea peoples called the Philistines, have set up a time of battle. What's interesting about this is when we look at the geography of the Old Testament, we often see that people perceived that the God of Israel was a God who often most inhabited the mountains. Remember Mount Sinai and the dramatic experience and expression of God's power? And the sea peoples or actually other people that the Israelites have encountered as they have begun to conquer the land, have often chosen to to stage those battles in a valley because the God of the mountains has to come down into the valley and they believe that their God had more power in the valley and this was an opportunity for the other's people to conquer the Israelites and be able to humiliate their God. And so as chapter 17 begins, we see that that's exactly what happened. The Philistines are in this broad valley. The Israelites have had to come out of the hills down into the valley. And into this valley is staged a representative battle, not unusual in ancient times. And Goliath, this giant who is well over nine feet tall, the scripture's telling us, wearing armor that probably weighs, you know, hundreds of pounds, is out on this valley battlefield taunting the Israelites. And he basically has said, look it, send your best guy out. Let's us battle. We'll determine who's going to win and who's going to lose, not with all of the forces coming together and, and fighting it out, but just the two of us. You send your best representative and let's see if God's going to be with him. The Philistines sending, of course, Goliath as their best representative and believing that they will be able to defeat the Israelites. And what's surprising here is that Saul and his team of men are just shaking and quaking. And Goliath comes out with the Philistine army behind him and keeps taunting the Israelites. It says for 40 days, and what we know in the Bible is when they say 40, it means a long time. Morning and evening, Goliath taunts them. And their response, instead of seeing who they could bring forward or or muster the courage to meet Goliath on the battlefield, instead they cover and and they step back. And the person who's leading this sort of fearful response is King Saul himself. The king that God has anointed, that God has empowered, has lost sight of who God is in this story. He doesn't seem to understand that God is still with them. God doesn't just exist in the mountains. God is with them as they have descended into the valley. And God would be with them in this battle. But Saul has so much lost sight of God's vision that he's consumed with the problem that is right in front of him. A giant, a Goliath, who seems insurmountable, a barrier that cannot possibly be overcome. This is a battle that they can't possibly win. And into this story comes David. David is just the shepherd boy who's been shuttling food from home to his brothers who are on the battlefield with Saul. It's like he's bringing lunch to the troops, to his brothers. And he starts to observe what's going on. And as the story goes, he He's incredulous. You see, when David looks out and sees this big giant Goliath, he's he's not intimidated at all because David sees something that Saul and the troops have missed. His perspective is not to just see the problem and to focus exclusively on the problem of who Goliath is and what he represents. Instead, What David sees is that Goliath, and he uses this taunt, he calls him an uncircumcised Philistine. In other words, he said he's not even a man of faith. He's he's not someone in whom God has made a covenant with. 
The Philistines have everything to be fearful because God the Almighty, God Yahweh is with us. And if we can see God's vision here, we don't need to be intimidated by the giant or the Goliath in front of us. Kind of reminds me of a story. Because sometimes I think when what we're looking for will help us uh, figure out what to do. I have a friend who had a daughter who had uh, braces. And, you know, like many of us parents, probably, you know, scolded her and told her if she ever lost her retainer, she would be in really big trouble. Because back in the day, that was a $300 problem if you had to replace that um, container, retainer. So she said that this friend was telling me they were at a Chinese restaurant and they were finishing up and their, you know, 13-year-old daughter excused herself from the table and said she had to go to the bathroom. And so the family's waiting and five minutes turns into 10 minutes, turns into 15 minutes, into 20. And suddenly the family's really quite concerned. What's happened to this, this young woman? So the mom took off and she went to the bathroom, couldn't find the daughter. And then she poked her head in the kitchen and said, has anyone seen my daughter? Her anxiety obviously rising. And the kitchen chef said, oh, she's out in the back in the dumpster. Well, the mom's like, what are you talking about? So she goes out and she finds her daughter, tears streaming down her face, just sobbing as she's trying to go through all the garbage. And she says, oh, mom, I left my retainer on my plate. And when they cleared the table after dinner, they took my retainer with them and then they had already taken out the garbage. And she said, I've been out here trying to find my retainer because you told me that if I ever lost it, I would be in big trouble. Well, you can imagine what happened. The mom got right inside that dumpster with her daughter. And while the daughter had been looking for almost 20 minutes, the mom looked around, started searching, and within less than a minute, she found that retainer. Of course, there were hugs all around and everyone was relieved. And later, this young daughter said, Mom, I don't understand. I was looking so hard for like 20 minutes, but you found it in like a minute. And the mom says, you know what? What you were looking for was your retainer. What I was looking for was 300 bucks. You know, isn't that the truth? When we, what we see and what we perceive changes the approach that we take to solving a problem. In David's case, he reframed this problem and saw it not just as the Goliath that he had to address, but he saw this instead as an opportunity for God's glory to shine he took on God's vision of what this situation was as was willing to take courageous steps in light of a larger vision. Suddenly, the problem shrunk down to a smaller and smaller problem. And his vision of God and God's capacity to meet David in this challenge and to meet the Israelites in this battlefield changed because he saw the problem differently. You know, we're all facing a ton of Goliaths in our lives right now. I mean, let's be honest. COVID-19 still continues. We have political unrest in this country and political division. We have great issues of social justice that we're trying to address. Hurricanes, fires, uh, ecological challenges everywhere we turn. It can be daunting, can't it? It can even be paralyzing. And then when we add to those big societal Goliaths, each one of us is very likely facing individual Goliaths, maybe ones that only you know about or very few people know about. In the midst of all of these big challenges, many people are expressing social dislocation from one another, that isolation that comes from the COVID-19 restrictions, People are feeling depressed and lonely. But you add on to that the regular challenges of family dynamics that can be strained, relational challenges or relationships that are just at the edge of breaking up or actually have broken up. We have issues that have been amplified in this season related to addiction. We have things, whether it's to a substance or to pornography or whatever it may be, we, we all have Goliaths that we're facing in our lives. And whether it's the big, great, big societal Goliaths or those ones that we face and we feel alone in, like David, in this moment, 
we have an opportunity to change our perception of the problem. And in changing that perception, what God is calling us here in this story is to not just focus on the challenge, to not just focus on the Goliath in front of us, but instead to switch our focus to who God is here, to what God is doing, what the possibilities are of God's glory shining forth in this situation. Now, it may be easy to say that, right? I mean, I don't know about you, but as we enter into September, we're starting our sixth month of this whole COVID-19 sort of drama that we've been dealing with as a church. And there are moments when, frankly, I'm so over COVID-19. I'm sure you are too. There are moments when I wake up and I think, oh my gosh, not again, not another day. Not, not another day where I feel as a person who lives alone, that social isolation, that, that lack of getting a hug from someone. Another day of being a pastor of a church where I don't get to see all of you. I don't, I don't get to interact with all of you. The, the things that make ministry for me so fulfilling. And it's often in those moments that as I begin to feel sorry for myself, and quite frankly, I've had quite a few pity parties over the last few months. There's this shift that happens in those pity parties when I begin to think, wait a minute. Maybe I've got myself all tangled up in the wrong side of this problem. What is God doing here? What can I be grateful for? How is God transforming? How is God showing forth this incredible creativity that God has? Where is the resilience and the places of hope that I see? And just about, I don't know, six, eight weeks ago, I began really praying Psalm 23, in those moments when I feel like I'm facing my own individual Goliath of, of social isolation, loneliness, the, the grief and bereavement that I've experienced in these last uh, few months as my brother died and not been able to go to Hawaii to see the family. And when I have thought about Psalm 23, of course I have to think about David. During this month, as we sort of pair the story of David and First and Second Samuel, we're going to be looking every week at a different set of phrases in Psalm 23. In fact, while most of us only really think about Psalm 23 at the time of a death, it actually is a powerful psalm that can help ground us in God's vision and, and give us guidance in how to move forward. Think about those first phrases in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters, he restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Friends, there's this vision of God who is the one that cares for us. And no matter what Goliaths we are facing, whether they're societal, global, whether they're personal and unspeakable, the promise of Psalm 23, just the same kind of promise that sustained David is that God is with us, that God is the great shepherd who cares for us. God will bring us into those places of respite where in our thirsty souls that that need a connection with God. When we turn to God, God will bring us to those waters and bring us into a place of peace. God is the one who, even though the way is uncharted, none of us, frankly, none of us know when COVID's gonna end. None of us quite know how we're gonna resolve the big challenges of social injustice and racial inequality in this country. None of us really know how we can even reach out and begin to comprehend the, the kind of property and ecologic, ecological destruction that a hurricane brings or fires in California or locusts and that are wiping out food sources all across Northern Africa. But what we can know is that God is the one who is leading us. And even though the path may be uncharted, we can trust and depend that God is there and leading us. Now, the challenging thing is that God doesn't often give us the end point. In David's life, he knew that he was going to be anointed king. He didn't know when that was going to be fulfilled. And there's a whole lot of challenges that David has to go that test David's 
faithfulness in God as the time just takes forever for him to fulfill that promise. But he never stopped trusting that God was with him, that God was with him every step of the way. You see, that's the basis of a faith that perseveres. Is even when we're, it's cloudy and we're unsure or we're discouraged or we're frustrated or we're aggravated or things just aren't going the way we want, even when the way is completely cloudy and unclear, we can trust that God will lead us in right paths for his name's sake. That God is guiding, and God may only give us enough illumination for this moment, this hour, even only for this day. But if we take that step toward the light, into the shepherd's care, into the shepherd's hands, and entrust ourselves and trust that God has a bigger vision for us, we're able to take that next step. We're able to move forward. We're able to trust and the fact that we can have faith in God and our faith will enable us to have the resilience and the ability to keep persevering even when the way ahead looks rocky or looks unclear, when the way ahead is uncertain because the Lord who is our shepherd is with us. As we continue in this service, this series called A Faith That Perseveres, I hope you'll take some time and perhaps read through the books of First and Second Samuel. What a, what a great opportunity that would be just to get your handle on a story that's familiar, but you may have lost sight of some of those details. But even more so, I want to challenge you in this month to pick up your Bibles and look at Psalm 23 and memorize it. Memorize this glorious psalm. It's only just a few verses. It's already probably in your hearts and heads because it's so familiar. But take this moment to memorize Psalm 23. And let me encourage you, maybe as the basis of when you wake up to recite it or to read it, at the end of the day before you go to sleep, to do the same. To let Psalm 23 become that verse that can provide assurance can provide a plan and a map for you to trust God when we have to face Goliaths in our lives. Friends, as we know the outcome of the story, Goliath never wins. In the end, God is always the one who shines forth and shines through in our lives. And while the battle itself may be a struggle, and while the outcomes may not always be the things that we think we're entitled to, nothing, the scriptures tell us, will separate us from that love of God that is extended to all of us because God is our shepherd. Amen.
Please join your hearts with mine in prayer. Loving God, sometimes it's hard to know how to pray. Of course, we are beyond grateful for the many, many blessings you provide, those we recognize as such as well as those we don't. Of course, we exalt you above all else. Of course, we are sorry for falling short of the vision you have for us. But how do we pray for ourselves, our families and neighbors, our church, our world, among all the strife around us? Where do we begin amidst escalating racial injustice, among other social injustices, divisive politicizing of basic rights and responsibilities, worsening natural disasters, violence, oppression, and exploitation around the world, all against the backdrop of a global pandemic with far-reaching impact on every aspect of our lives. Maybe we begin by listening more intently to you. Help us to hear your words for us now in this moment of silence and throughout our days. Gracious God, show us the way around, over, under, through the obstacles that threaten our well-being. Remind us that there are no challenges that cannot be overcome when we turn to you first and always. Help us to embrace your vision for us, even as the path forward feels rocky and unsure. Open our minds to see the possibilities for growth that might come from difficult times and to recognize that you provide all we need for such growth. Hear us now as we pray together the prayer your son taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen.
Now go out from this place. Whatever Goliaths you face in your life, whether it's the big, grand Goliaths of the great problems that our country is facing and the world is struggling with, or whether it's those quiet Goliaths that only you know about, remember that as we take on God's vision of the issue, if we can see the problem from God's perspective, God will lead us beside still waters. He will restore our souls and he will lead us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So go out, trusting God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. My name is Debbie Whaley and I'm the pastor here at Mount Washington Presbyterian Church. We're so delighted that you joined us today for worship and I hope that you will consider being part of our community. You can find out more about us on the web at mwpc-church.org. There's giving links below. Have a great week.